Hi, my name is Sue Berdoulis, and I'm the daughter of the Most High King, and I'm loved and enjoyed by God our Father, and I know that you are also. I serve as the director of the Cameo Healing Rooms, which has been in operation to, since 2006. Tonight we're going to begin our Psalm 100 series entitled Keys to Joy-Filled Living. And our first session is calling Knowing the Joyful Jesus. This Psalm 100 series will actually revolutionize the way you live life if you actually put into implementation the commands that the Lord gives us in Psalm 100. And the foundational Psalm 100 command or key to joyful living is knowing God. When we know God through his son Jesus Christ, we will be filled with joy and then we will be able to carry out these seven commands given to us in Psalm 100. Let us pray. Father, I thank you and I praise you, Father, for tonight. I thank you that your son Jesus Christ is filled with joy and that he perfectly reflected the joy that is in you, your heart. I thank you that you are the most joyful being in the entire universe. And I pray that you would open up the eyes of our understanding tonight so that we can know you as you desire for us to know you. And I pray that you would feel our hearts, feel our lives, feel the atmosphere of this place with your joy, the joy of your son, Jesus Christ, the joy of knowing him, the joy of knowing you. We love you, Lord. And we thank you that you delight over us and you dance and sing over us because you are our joyful king and our joyful father. Amen. How many saw Jesus doing the dee-da dance? You know, <laughs> you know how uh, it's so interesting as grandparents, you know, we have one grandchild now and the grandchildren just will just dance, right? You know, just real free and... I know God, our Heavenly Father, just like us as grandparents or parents, will sit there and dance with our kids. And I know that God, He is the one that's initiating this joy-filled atmosphere, the dancing, the singing. He loves celebration. So throughout the Old Testament, you see all these celebrations honoring Him and now we know honoring his son, Jesus Christ. And in heaven, we're going to be in, eternally invited to a banquet. And it's going to be filled with joy and laughter. And Jesus legislates from heaven with joy in his heart. Let us declare Psalm 100. And as you can see on your handout, I actually put the Lord in bold and all of the personal pronouns for Lord also emboldened. So let us stand up and declare Psalm 100. It's five short verses. Let's declare that out loud. Make a joyful shout to the Lord, all you lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Be thankful to him and bless his name. For the Lord is good, his mercy is everlasting, and his truth to all generations. Amen. So you can be seated. Did you understand why we can have joy in our heart? Because the Lord, he's good, his mercy is everlasting, and his faithfulness or his truth is to all generations. If you take a look at Psalm 100, how many times do you see the actual word Lord occurring there? Yeah, do I hear it? <laughs> Four times. We see the name Lord occurring there. And if you take in all of the personal pronouns, you will see 12 times there's a reference to the Lord. So the focal point of this psalm is 
our Lord. And we know that Jesus, over 100 times in the New Testament, his name is called Lord. Jesus is Lord. So it is very interesting when we were studying Psalm 103, we had Lord appear in Psalm 103 11 times. And we were called to bless the Lord, oh my soul, and all that is within me to bless his holy name, and not to forget any of his benefits. And this is basically what Psalm 100 is a call to. We are calling our souls to go ahead and bless the Lord in seven different ways. To come, there's commands, come before his presence. Make a joyful shout. So there's actual seven commands that are in Psalm 100 seven ways or seven keys that we can enter in to the joy of the Lord. And the more that we know who God is as revealed through his son, Jesus Christ, the more we will be filled with, with the actual joy of Jesus, which is ver the very source of genuine joy. We can have joy that's temporal from this world, but it's not going to be the eternal joy that will last forever and ever. And we want to connect our hearts to genuine joy. And the genuine joy originates from our Father. And it was embodied in Jesus Christ. And now, where is Jesus? He's in us. And so where is his joy residing? In us. So we carry the joy of the Lord in our spirit. And God wants to see the joy of Jesus being manifested in our lives and upon our face. How often do you go somewhere and you see someone just welcoming you or just like smiling ear to ear and you're going like, wow. You know, I said to my sister-in-law when we were visiting her in Sacramento because we came like a, almost a full day early and she's just like, yeah, come on over. And I go, well, we'll take you out to meal, you know, so you don't have to cook. And she's going, no, I'm going to cook, you know, and I'm so glad you're here. And Sunday when I was in church this past Sunday, somebody greeted me that I haven't seen for a long time because they're just coming back to visit our church. And there that same grin was upon their face, that same joy. And I'm going like, I said to my sister-in-law, you are the epitome of Jesus Christ, <laughs> you know? And this lady I saw in church on Sunday, oh wow, the joy. And this is the joy that people want to encounter. People in this world are hungry for joy. And Psalm 100 gives us keys so that we can live a joy-filled life. Now, some of you might be waiting a long time if you wait until you actually feel joy to actually obey these seven commands in Psalm 100. But how many people know that Actually, when you begin, you might not feel like going to a celebration, feel like doing something, but when you begin actually doing the things that God calls us to do, then the joy comes, the joy of the Lord fills our heart, and then we're able to serve Him with gladness. So don't wait for the feelings, just begin the doing. You know, often we go ahead and we want to you know, do something for the Lord and for our God and Savior. We want to do that for Him. But we don't realize that when we're doing something for the Lord, Jesus is alongside of us as well as in us, and He comes with us in the doing. <laughs> And he's just embracing us with his joyful spirit and going, come on, you know. And he then, if we allow the atmosphere that he carries to encompass our hearts, we then will be serving the Lord with joy and gladness. Now, the first time that we see the actual word Lord mentioned 
and it actually appears in Hebrew as Yahweh, and they did not want to actually spell the name Yahweh out because the people in the Old Testament thought that Yahweh was so holy that they would not pronounce it. So they would actually leave the vowels out of Yahweh so no one pr would pronounce it. So you would, you'll see then in the Old Testament, in Hebrew, you'll see it, you know, the, but you'll see it in the Hebrew um, language. But Y-W-H-W, uh, Y-W, well, I'm going I'm to say that wrong, Y-H-W-H. And when, where you see this, it actually is translated into English in capital letters, L-O-R-D. And the first time that you'll actually see Yahweh or Lord mentioned is when Moses, he's out in the desert and God appears to him in a burning bush. Talk about a little bit of trippy, you know. <laughs> what would you do when a bush starts burning out in the desert and no match has been put to it? And then the, the glory, not just it's burning, but the glory is surrounding this bush. And the bush starts talking. The Lord starts talking out of the bush. And the Lord commands Moses to actually go back to Egypt where he had fled from because he murdered someone and was very scared and he was hanging out in the wilderness. The Lord tells him to go back to Egypt and to speak with Pharaoh, the king. And normally somebody like in uh, Moses' place would really be shaking in his boots to go talk to Pharaoh, the king. And he's going like, God, who am I to tell the people who you are? God responds from the burning bush, tell them, I am who I am. Tell them, I am sent you. And it's like, oh. <laughs> so here God describes himself in his relationship to mankind as Yahweh. I am. He is the self-existing one. No one created him. He is I am, the great I am. He was, he is, and he always will be. Who? Yahweh, the great I am. And we see this name Yahweh appearing as Lord, L-O-R-D. Now, to make it a long story real short, they actually took then this word, Yahweh, where they took the vowels out, Y-H-W-H. They combined it with the vowels of Adonai, and that's where they came up with Jehovah. So now when we see Jehovah, his redemptive name, anytime you see Jehovah, and you see it especially with another name attached, a compound name like Jehovah Rapha, Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah Nisi, Jehovah Sitkanu. That's a compound name. Jehovah is referring to Lord. I am, like Rapha, I am who? The Lord who heals you. I am Jehovah Jireh. I am the Lord who will provide for you. And so I have a list there of the seven redemptive names of God, and you'll be able to go online and actually download this from Camryo Helium Room slash prayer, this resource, um, so that you can use it in declaring God's lordship um, over your life. In the New Testament, when God commands you, in Psalm 100, God commands us to know that the Lord, he is God. And in the New Testament, when we are commanded to know that the Lord is God, we are being commanded to know that Jesus is Lord, which involves like Romans 10, 9 says, if you confess him with your mouth and if you confess with your mouth the Lord is Jesus Christ, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, 
you will be saved. So knowing that the Lord is God, like Psalm 100 commands us in verse 3, as a new covenant believer, to know means to confess and believe in our heart. To believe in our heart and confess with our mouth. So now you can see this chart that I have in your handout, which you also can now downline in a more uh, fuller version with all the scriptures um, from Camriel Healing Rooms, the prayer section. You'll see the compound names of the Lord and who he is. There are seven primary ones that are listed. God's compound name will meet every, his redemptive names will meet every need you have. As you can see, by his name, the, like Jehovah Jireh, you will see the blessing in the name itself. The Lord will provide. The blessing is in the name, and the blessing obliterates or demolishes or destroys the curse. So what is the curse? It's lack, okay? So when we, if you take a look at any of these curses and you're going, ha, I'm experiencing this curse in an area of my life, then you take the name of the Lord and start declaring the name of the Lord over that situation because it says in Philippians 2, 9 through 11, which all of us know, but we don't always apply what we know. And that's what I think I really heard in the testimony I'll tell in a minute about Kenneth Copeland is that he actually, even though he knew all these things because he's a man of the word about God, he actually had to do it with his own mouth and he had to do it for some time. And so if a man of God that knows God that well has to persist in declaring who God is over his life to see the victory. How about us, right? We love that Jesus did it one time and we love when it happens one time, but we don't want to give up until we see the victory of Jesus' name manifesting in our lives. So Philippians 2, 9 through 11, let's say all that, let's say it together. Therefore... God has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of those in heaven and those on earth and those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Did you notice that? that there, every tongue's going to have to confess that Jesus is Lord, it's easy for us to take Psalm 100 in good times and confess that Jesus is Lord, to bless his name, to shout joyfully to the Lord. But how about in bad times? You know, here's Moses, and he had to go before Pharaoh. <laughs> and it wasn't like all the cards were on the, his side in the natural realm. But he had to declare the name of the Lord in front of the most powerful king on planet Earth at that time. But we know that there was a higher king and a higher name that would rule over Pharaoh and deliver the entire Israelite nation from bondage as every knee in Egypt had to bow to the name of the great I am. And that is how it is for you and I. How many have read that blog that I put out on Sunday about shout it out? A few of you, great. I'm going to actually go over that because one of the things my girlfriend said, and she's known me since our kids were really small and I moved into the area, we were walking, uh, I think it was just last week, and she said, Sue, I didn't know you could write. <laughs> and, I, and, you know, she goes, how do you come up with these things? 
And I said, actually, I get down on my knees and I say, Lord, you speak. You say what you want to say. And he gives me ideas and he writes through me. And the more we submit to the lordship like that, we can hear his voice. So I say that because maybe that will encourage you in some of the blogs that I write that I really am trying to hear the voice of the Lord for our healing room and for the people that are attending and, and what he wants to say to us, the timely word for us. So I based this last blog on Sunday, <laughs> it was, make a joyful shout to the Lord. I started out by saying this, what will you shout out when the troubles of life seem overwhelming? What will you shout out when the pain is so great that the pain-filled response wants to pour forth from your lips? What will you shout out when the perfect day you envision seems to be messed up by problems and delays? Will your mouth dance to the words and the rhythm of circumstances? Or will you make the choice to make a joyful shout to the Lord? Last weekend, my husband and I were at the conference in Sacramento where Kenneth Copeland, who's now 82 years old, he was actually sharing his personal testimony that I was sharing to you in the Psalm 103 class. But I got more details of his testimony that I didn't know, and it gave me a fuller picture. And I'm still, I know we don't have the fullest picture. But it emphasized to me the power of shouting out to the Lord. And it's a perfect example of Psalm 101, that even in the midst of painful circumstances, and especially in the midst of painful circumstances, God wants us to make a joyful shout to the Lord. So around 70 years old, Kenneth wanted to quit the ministry, figuring the Lord, he had served him already for 40 years. At that time in his life, he had a number of physical ailments, including degenerative joint disease in his spine with a disc, and he said a bony fragment that protruded into his spinal column, causing, he said, excruciating pain, pain basically that could not it kind of prevents you from thinking and operating. And I remember at that time looking back because I had just entered into trying to believe the Lord and I started getting these letters or, you know, things from Kenneth Copeland Ministry um, back then. And I remember him sending out and it was a declaration over his life for the pain. You know, he wasn't saying like come in agreement with me pain, but he had scriptures listed. And he goes, I want all my partners to declare these scriptures over me. So that fact he didn't share in his testimony, but I remember that and that related to this testimony. So that's a wonderful thing that we all can do is instead of telling people our problems, give them a list of scriptures. Give them the name of the Lord to declare and shout over your circumstance. Anyway, he said that he put a heating pad on his back and the goal of the heating pad was so that he turned it up to the highest setting so that it would cause him to think about the heat and not the pain, but it didn't work. And so he went outside and he just started to shout to the Lord all the praises he could think of. And he went on shouting it to the Lord every praise. So he started shouting to Lord, I thank you and praise you for the trees. I thank you for the wind. I thank you for the beautiful grass, Lord. So he just literally just went and praised God for everything he could think of. And that reminds me of when we had a lady and she came to um, our healing rooms and she was healed of one thing. It was fibromyalgia. She had had it for many years. She was a medical doctor, and she had it for many years in her life. And I'll never forget, she was over here, and somebody handed her a flag during worship. She was attending our church, and she thought, I am not going to be able to do this flag. And that fibromyalgia pain, you know, came on her. And she said what she did is she went uh, flat down on her face and she just started declaring because she was going through the 365 names of God every name 
there was of God. That was actually the second time. She got healed when she was worshiping, and then when it came back the second time at her home, that's what she did, and the pain left and never returned. Declaring the name of the Lord. What happens when we declare the name of the Lord is that he actually shows up on the scene, and he is the one that takes care of our enemy. So back to Kenneth Copeland, his testimony. He shouted out, not just one day, but many, many, many days. And then if you go to his actual blog in December of 2016, you actually see him write this. Somewhere along the way, my physical body started changing. I don't know exactly when, but I can tell you this. 16 months later, all signs of degenerative joint disease had vanished. He said, I'll be 80 years old this month. That was back when, two years ago. And instead of slowing down, I'm gearing up. Instead of getting weaker, I'm getting stronger. My physical body has been quickened by the resurrection power of God. And so I wrote in my blog, I wish you could have witnessed the strength and zeal of Kenneth Copeland preaching the infallible good news of Jesus Christ this past weekend, demonstrating the power of God that had renewed his strength. But what would have happened if he had not made a joyful shout to the Lord and continued to make the joyful shout to the Lord and not quit until he had his complete healing? Amen. Now, 82 years old, he was the speaker, the primary speaker. He only had one other speaker. And so he was basically preaching from the morning till evening in all the services, except for, you know, he had one speaker that would um, come in at one, you know, certain times. So 82 years old, and he was walking back and forth, and it was just tremendous. So anyway, so last week on Thursday, my husband comes home from his breakfast meeting, and he has this big blotch on his shirt. I'm going like, what's that? Well, he loves to have pepper plant on his eggs, and when he was unscrewing the pepper plant, it exploded all over the place and went on his plain blue shirt. <laughs> so he comes home and he goes, what should I do? Shout it out. <laughs> How many remember shout? Okay. We didn't have shout in the house, so we had a shout-like solution. And so he put it on his shirt, and I said, now let it soak. We have to saturate the messes in life with the word of God, with God's name. We have to let it soak into us, just like my husband did with his shirt. So I said, with a little shout-like so solution, saturating the mess, his shirt came out completely clean. It's time to saturate the messes in your life and those around you with a joyful shout to the Lord. Shout out who God is and what he has victoriously done in your life and through his son, Jesus Christ. And no matter what mess you or your loved ones have found yourself, and don't give up your victorious shout to the Lord until you can see that your shout has taken it out. You name the it, then saturate it with thanksgiving and praise to God. Your joyful shout will take it out. So it's time to make our joyful shout to the Lord. Whatever is afflicting you, how many remember Psalm 103? Okay, five benefits, that was grace, forgives all of our sins, heals all of our diseases, redeems our life from the pit of destruction, crowns our life with loving kindness and compassion, and satisfies our mouth with good things. So that's something to shout about. <laughs> I don't know if anyone has... Uh, been in church service was with me and you hear a woohoo or something like that it's me in the back <laughs> okay psalm 47 1 through 3 let's all read this out loud it says oh clap your hands all you people shout to god with the voice of triumph 
For the Lord Most High is awesome. He is a great king over all the earth. He will subdue the peoples under us and the nations under our feet. Do you notice that? It says, shout to God. Now, Psalm 100 says joyfully, but this says with the voice of triumph. You know what the voice of triumph means? You have already triumphed. You have the victory. You have the victory in Jesus Christ. You know, in the ancient cities, during the Old Testament time, they didn't have the Internet and social media and Facebook and Instagram and all that. So the good news traveled by word of mouth. And when the good news entered into the city, they would trumpet blast. And then people would come and gather. And they would share the good news. And then guess what happened after they shared the good news? A joyful shout burst forth. We owe us, according to Psalm 103, we have something joyfully to shout about because Jesus has triumphed for us. And we are in Jesus and Jesus is in us. And there's nothing that can subdue us. We are the ones that subdue our enemy as we shout joyfully the name of the Lord. So I gave you a little template where you can take and look at one of the lacks in your life according to the chart and then put that lack into one of these boxes and shout the name of the Lord. Now you can do it in any fashion you want, but this is just kind of like to help get you going on how to do this. So if you are in any lack, food, clothing, home, you lack a job, you lack a good relationship, you lack some finances. If you're in any form of lack, what you're going to do where it says name the affliction, you're going to put that lack in there. And then the opposite or the name of God that takes care of your lacks is the Lord will provide. Jehovah Jireh. So we're going to say Jehovah Jireh, the Lord will provide in the place where it says his redemptive name. So let's all stand and declare this together. You can see it bold. Can you see this on your handout? Jesus, I thank you and praise you for being Lord over my life. Everyone there? Okay. Let's declare this out loud. Jesus, I thank you and praise you for being Lord over my life. I declare your name. Jehovah Jireh, the Lord will provide over, now name the lack. I praise you and thank you. You are Jehovah Jireh, the Lord will provide. I believe and receive you into my heart and to my circumstances as Jehovah Jireh, the Lord will provide. I have overcome, name the affliction, the lack that you have overcome, because greater are you who is in me than he who is in the world. Amen? Amen. And even as you said this, power goes out into the atmosphere, and the Lord then is able to perform the very word that you have sent out, you're putting his angels to work for you, just like Psalm 103 told us. Go ahead and sit down. You can do this um, later on with the example that I gave you for Jehovah Rapha, but I, it's, I made it really simple. But you can go ahead, I mean, you can do this for five minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, 20 minutes. Anytime you think of it, I am uh, confronting an affliction in one of my eyes. And so when I look in the mirror, it's just a little bump on my eye. And it doesn't, invo you know, doctor said it doesn't, doesn't, <laughs> has no effect on anything, right? <laughs> um, but I didn't want it there. It's not supposed to be there. So many times in life we get accustomed to something and the Lord says, if you don't want it there and I don't want it there, it's not supposed to be there. Start talking to it, you know? So when I look in the mirror, I just remind myself, and it's been shrinking and shrinking and shrinking. It's on my, you know, inside the eye. And so it's just like, yay, Lord, you know? Because we need to take 
authority in our own lives by declaring the name of the Lord, Jehovah Rapha, in an area that needs healing in our body. And then confidence as we, just like King David, when he took out, you know, the lion and the bear, you know, and, and the, uh, he slayed Goliath and he did these things and then he ruled over Israel. We need to start slaying the little things in our life and then the bigger things will have more and more confidence so that we can go ahead and stand in God knowing that he's there with us and he's going to be performing on our behalf. Amen? Okay. So this is just a reminder from Colossians 1, 1.15 that Jesus is the Im image of the invisible God. In Hebrews 1.3 that he, Jesus is the express image of God. So what I want you to do now you get a stand again. <laughs> We're full of declarations tonight. And it's good that it's out of your mouth and not just my mouth. Because too often when somebody's up in front here, we become passive. And so this is an active exercise. Wherever it says Lord, most often, or he or his referring to Lord, we're going to put in Jesus' name because Jesus is Lord and Jesus is the express image of God. And just as you do this, I want to envision Jesus with this great big smile on his face, so delighted that you are making a joyful shout about him and that you're making him large in your life. Okay, verse one, and we just go through the five verses together. Make a joyful shout to Jesus! All you lands, serve Jesus with gladness. Come before Jesus' presence with joyful singing. Know that Jesus, he is God. It is Jesus who made us and not we ourselves. We are Jesus' people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Be thankful to Jesus and bless Jesus' name. For Jesus is good, his mercy is everlasting, his truth to all generations. Amen. Can you feel the joy of Jesus? <laughs> oh, Jesus loves, loves, loves to laugh and smile. When I started meditating on Psalm 100, I, it's like my, my whole, it's like really the Holy Spirit got to grab a hold of me and it was like, Woo! Jesus, you know, and I wanted to find Jesus in the Psalms and I wanted you guys to know Jesus in the Psalms. But when I started doing Psalm 100 and I started to see the smile of Jesus, and I started to see him like I've never seen him in the New Testament. Honestly, you guys, as I started to meditate on this psalm this last week, I saw Jesus, you know, we know at his birth, well, I'll just go through this, in Luke 10, um, God tells his angels, hey, I want to have you announce this to the shepherds. And he says, tell this, them. tell the shepherds this. So the angels say this to the shepherds. I bring you good news of great joy, which will be to all people. For there is born to you in this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. Did you hear that? Good news of little tiny bitsy joy. No, great joy. God had been waiting for this time for his son Jesus to come into the world to save us. The angels are rejoicing in heaven and they break forth into this song. And the shepherds, they get a whiff of who Jesus is and what God had spoken to them. And it actually talks about the joy that infiltrated their hearts. And the joy that was announced at Jesus' birth, this joy is in you. Who was this good news of great joy, joy to? All people. Now, when we see Psalm 100, verse 1, make a joyful shout to the Lord, all you lands. 
This is very similar to the announcement of Jesus' birth. Who are all the lands? Same thing as Luke 2.10. All the people. Make a joyful shout in your life because Jesus has come to save you. Every day of your life, in every situation, he loves to save, he loves to help. So, I want to go to now Jesus' earthly ministry. In Jesus' earthly ministry, I've preached this many times, and I love it. Because in Psalm 100, it tells us that we are to bless the Lord. We are to praise him because it says, for the Lord is good. And then when we hear about what Jesus does in his earthly ministries in Acts 10, 38, it says this, that he, Jesus, went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil. So we know that. I knew that. But for some reason, I never saw the face of Jesus. You know, like he really was during these times. We think of Jesus as some of the pictures that we've seen in paintings and things like this with this somber face and everyone, you know, someone is just healed. And you're like, somber? No. I saw Jesus for the first time as I was doing this, that Jesus' joy was on his face as he healed, as he went about doing good. The children came to him because children, they don't know any better. They don't have their walls and screens. So they came to him because there was an atmosphere of joy that he exuded from his personality and from his character. So there's a song we began at the beginning of this year when we started studying the Psalms, and it was Blessed is the Man. But then Wes, his song on Psalm 1, do you, re you guys all remember how it starts out? Because blessed means happy, happy, happy. The blessed man in Psalm 1 is Jesus Christ. Happy, happy, happy is Jesus and I just love that song because it really portrays, but we need to see Jesus ministering with a smile, with great joy. And then we as ministers and as believers in Christ need to go ahead and minister likewise. Now, who remembers the first miracle that Jesus did? Wine! That's right. And what was he accused of? As a wine bibber and a glutton. And I thought, why did they accuse him of that? Because I was going kind of through the miracles, you know, um, this last week, and I was going like, why was he accused of that? Oh, because people, that's often associated with people that get drunk, you know, is that they don't have the inhibitions, and so they're just like at the beginning at least, you know, like, Ha, 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 you know, everything's kind of happy. And so Jesus was so happy that he was accused of being a wine bipper. And we don't think of it like that. We, oh, Sue, come on, you know, that was just something else. But that's how I saw the story. Okay, some testimonies. When I was at the Kenneth Copeland Conference, a lady that was next to me, she well, worship is going on, and they were just saying, like, you know, God's beginning to do miracles or whatever while worship is going on. And the lady next to me, she goes, oh, she was so happy. She goes, I was seeing spots in this eye, and I'm not seeing spots. And, of course, she had to tell me several times, several different times throughout the worship and even when she sat down, because that's what happens when you start overflowing with joy. When God says, make a joyful shout to the Lord, he doesn't say, like, Come on, muster it up. No, he fills us with the answer to our prayer 
and it just starts bursting out of us. You don't have to tell when we're going to be going to the Dodger game um, this year in July for fireworks. I like to see the fireworks. My husband likes to see the game. <laughs> I like to talk. My husband watches the game. But anyway, um, you don't have to tell people to be joyful. They just, you know, they're joyful because they want to see the game. When people are healed, they're joyful. I'll never forget when we were down in Brazil with Randy Clark, and they were actually having medical doctors do a, an exam on people for their hearing and their eyesight before and after prayer. And so my prayer partner and I, we were praying for a man that had a hearing loss, I believe it was. And we're praying for him. And he becomes all excited. He runs to the room to get the medical doctor to, like, you know. And I didn't understand at that time. He had to have the before and after medical report. But he ran to get the doctor's report. Then he ran back to tell us that he was healed, you know. The medical report revealed what had just happened to him. But he was an older man, and he was actually dancing and twirling around because Jesus filled him with joy. And that's who our God is. He wants to fill us up with joy. So on the way to the cross, God, Jesus knew he was going to face some extreme suffering. But it said, because of the joy set before him, he endured the cross. What's that joy? It's you and I. And it's you and I being filled with his joy because he knew what he would do would break the curse so that the blessing would be upon you. John 15, it says this. Jesus, here he is in his last hours before the cross. And one of his concerns is that you and I would be filled with joy. He says, these things I have spoken to you, that my joy may remain in you, and your joy may be made full. Jesus had a genuine concern that his joy would remain in them. That means that Jesus must have been a joyful person in that atmosphere of joy had already touched the disciples. Otherwise, the saying would have been kind of weird, right? And he says he wanted their joy to even be made like more full, complete. So what are these things in John 15, 11 referring to? We've got to go back to the very beginning of the chapter, and this kind of like sings John 15, 5, kind of like sings the song of Psalm 100. Jesus says, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. So this is how. You be, this is like one of the major keys to you living a joy-filled life is staying connected to the vine and drawing from the life of Jesus as a branch. And as you draw from him, you're drawing his peace, his love, but also his joy. And in John 15, Right before John 15, 11, where God, Jesus says, I want my joy to remain in you and the joy would be made full. He says this, as the Father loved me, I also have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I kept my father com Father's commandments and abide in his love. So once again, that vine and the branch, we're abiding in his love. But Jesus is giving us some keys of abiding in his love. It's abiding in his commandments. So in Psalm 100, we're given seven commandments or seven keys to abide in his love, seven keys to abide in his joy. And as we the Lord, as we stay connected to the vine, we're able to be filled with his joy from knowing who he is. And out of that joy, it'll be easy to do these commandments, make a joyful, 
shout, beginning with uh, verse 1 in Psalm 100, make a joyful shout to God. Um, so I just wanted to end with Roman numeral 3, Jesus' joy in you. The foundational key to joy-filled living, experiencing great joy, genuine joy, is knowing the Lord your God is revealed through Jesus Christ and abiding in that reality. Um, you can read some of that stuff on your own. I want to go to Isaiah 61. When Jesus entered and the temple right after his wilderness temptation, and he declares his mission statement, he is quoting from Isaiah 61. And he starts out in verse 1, and he says in Isaiah 61, which you find in Luke 4, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me. And as you go on in Isaiah 61, which is not recorded in Luke 4, his mission statement, it says, to give me beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning. So when you become a Christian, you have this great exchange of your ashes for his beauty. And throughout your life, you can always come for this great exchange your ashes, things that are just like, ah, I don't see how this could have ever happened, but it's happened. You can come for his oil of joy. Then Hebrews 1, 9, God actually anointed Jesus with the oil of gladness. The oil of gladness that was in Father God's heart, Jesus was anointed with. And now you have been anointed with. It says, Hebrews 1, 9, Therefore God your God has anointed you with the oil of gladness more than your companions. Jesus' joy far outweighs any joy you've ever seen. And it's amazing if you, this week, just take some time to start meditating on Jesus, the one who is filled with joy, and he wants you to know him as the joyful God. Amen. So let us pray. Father, I just thank you and I praise you for what you have shown us through Psalm 100, that, Father, you have given us your son, Jesus Christ, the good news of great joy, and that you have given us the same anointing that is on Jesus, the oil of gladness. And so, Father, we thank you right now for that oil of gladness, the oil of joy permeating our hearts, our thoughts, our imagination, our mind, and our actions this week. In Jesus' name, amen.